Hello everybody, um, this is the first lecture from a series of lectures on fluid mechanics and the objectives of this lecture are actually listed um, here. First I will give you a brief introduction of fluid mechanics, then I will talk about the dimensional homogeneity, then I will talk about the properties of the fluid like density, specific gravity, specific volume and specific weight. Alright, so here are the objectives, but before I actually start out this um, uh, lecture I just want to point out some of the <coughs> that some of the books that are very uh, good in this area of fluid mechanics so if you want to learn this material I would highly suggest that at least you should have one of those books and um, one of the books actually is the fundamentals of fluid mechanics by Munson the other one is fluid mechanics by white the third one is fluid mechanics fundamentals and applications by Singel so if you have any of those books um, you're in pretty good shape in order to learn this material so let's actually take a look at what um, is actually a fluid mechanics and I have the definition and this is I'm sure you must have seen it in um, any of the physics text that what is a mechanics so again you have fluid and then you have mechanics so what is a mechanics mechanics is a branch of physics that studies the behavior of physical bodies under the influence of forces or displacement so basically if you have a physical body and you are applying a force you want to you want to find out how the body would behave and even if it's not behaving what are the stresses and everything is generated on that and what will be the impact um, on the surrounding or even if you displace that body to a certain location so how it will impact the the surrounding or the environment so this is the definition of a mechanics and that actually is true and then the definition from a physics text you will notice that the fluid is defined as something which is it includes both gases and liquids which can easily deform and do not maintain a fixed shape it takes on the shape of the container so this is also true that um, a fluid does not have any fixed shape so if you put it in a container it basically it adapts to the shape of the container and that's how you will define fluid and both of these definitions actually hold true in the fluid mechanics but we have something additional if you are um, taking an engineering course and I'm sure you must be because that's why you're listening to these lectures of fluid mechanics so we have an additional definition of a um, fluid and I will uh, discuss that in a minute all right so one thing before I give the dem definition of a fluid from an engineering perspective I just want to point this out um, in all the fluid mechanics courses we um, we make an um, I mean we take the continuum um, approach okay so we take the continuum approach which actually is so what what it means is we treat properties of substance uniform throughout okay so what what do we exactly mean by that and if you notice a fluid it could be a liquid it could be a gas it will have a lot of molecules in it okay so you it's a combination of a lot of molecules so we actually don't study the effect of individual molecules but in fact we study the collective behavior of all those molecules so if I say that, um, I mean, so if, if I take this region, it will be the same as if I take this region. So basically I'm saying that when, once I pick up an element or some region, it will be uniform all across and you will have a defined pressure, defined temperature, and all the other properties will be well defined. So this is a continuum approach and in fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, and so on, we always treat things as continuum unless you actually go to uh, verified gases when you actually have to look at individual molecules but most of the fluid courses actually take this continuum approach so that is one thing I want to establish in, in uh, at the beginning so anytime I will talk about taking an element it will basically be an element which will be um, a continuum so it will have all the properties that I uh, we are interested in finding okay so that's um, for the continuum Alright, so what actually is fluid? 
from an engineering perspective so again it is true that it um, it basically takes the shape of the container but in addition to that fluid is defined as a substance that deforms continuously u s continuously when acted on by a shearing stress of any magnitude okay so what does it mean again um, we have the continuum approximation so so let's actually take a um, so over here I'm going to write this as solid so let me take an element over here so this is a solid element and I have um, so let's suppose I glue it with a plate over here okay so it's being stuck with this plate and then I have another plate on the top okay so this uh, solid element basically sticks with this and then you have a top plate which is also uh, is attached to this uh, element or this block and then you move the top plate okay so with some force which actually will be a shearing force so after a while you will notice that if the shear force is more you will notice that after a while that the fluid will I mean the, the the solid element will actually deform to a new shape something like this okay so it will still be sticking to the bottom but then again now it has a newer shape and after a while I mean you can find out what the uh, the shear strain is so if this is your shear stress so I mean the top plate tries to move this direction and of course the the solid object would also move in this direction and then you will be able to find some shear strain but the and uh, and it will stop after a while because whatever the shear uh, st um, strain had to be I mean had to occur it will occur initially and then it will um, be in this position but for the case of the fluid so if I have the fluid over here again the same um, size element I can take or same size over here and I have a plate at the bottom and I have a plate at the bottom uh, at the top and this is one thing that the fluid element actually fluid particles actually sticks with the wall and this is called a no slip boundary condition and of course we I mean we always use this in the fluid mechanics so no slip boundary condition so in other words fluid will always stick to the boundaries so now when I try to move the top plate the fluid first of all of any magnitude okay so at any magnitude fluid will start to deform continuously so initially if you continue to supply some shear stress which is represented with tau and again we will look a little bit uh, this concept more closely when we will talk about the viscosity and everything and in fact this is how you measure the viscosity and every um, of the of the fluids um, but right now I'm just defining in terms of um, engineering how you define the fluid which continuously uh, deforms when the shear stress is acting on that so it will deform in this shape and then later on you will notice that it will keep on deforming and then I mean so they will it, it won't stop after a while even though uh, for a solid it will stop but for the fluid it won't and then again um, we will define that in fact we are not looking at the the shear strain but in fact we are looking at the rate of shear strain because um, we want to find out how fast things are um, like deforming and that basically tells us what the viscosity is but that is for um, for the next lecture but right now I just wanna mention that, that this is how you define the fluid in engineering terms that deforms continuously when acted on by a shearing stress of any magnitude so that's important so as long as so as soon as some shearing stress is applied fluid will start to deform some fluids deform more some less but they all will deform 
all right so that is for the uh, fluid definition and in fact let's actually talk about some of the applications and not only these are applications it's more to do of some of your observations also like for example um, blood flow in your veins is an example of fluid mechanics then also um, the shape of cars and trucks they are of a certain shape um, like they are aerodynamically shaped or streamlined so shape of cars and trucks to reduce drag drag force and essentially you want to minimize your fuel consumption and uh, and cost of the of course you want to uh, save money doing that um, and the next thing is why airplanes fly so we can talk about that also and then we have wind turbines um, like regular turbines pumps etc and um, I mean there are so many examples of fluid mechanics out there um, again you have some examples of surface tension um, like um, why you use detergents uh, when you're washing your clothes uh, why um, again so how plants actually get their how plants get nutrients and and etc I mean there are so many examples of fluid mechanics out there that it's um, um, and it's it's a pretty fa fascinating field that um, any anywhere you will see you will find some application of fluid mechanics in fact our weather patterns can also be um, uh, considered to be the f I mean again the fluid mechanics is also involved heavily in the our wet weather patterns also okay so again let me start out with the first thing uh, which I define as the dimensional homogeneity so what that means is that any fluid quantity and by the way this is not only true for fluid but for any uh, physical quantity or any equation that you're dealing with um, any physical quantity can be written in terms of basic dimensions okay so again so the idea is any uh, fluid uh, property I should say or any fluid uh, property can be written in terms of basic dimensions and again what are our basic dimension mass represented with capital letter M then we have the length which is L then we have the time which we normally represent with capital letter T then we have the temperature which we represent with the capital letter theta so we call this as MLT theta system so any physical quantity or any fluid property can be defined in terms of these basic dimensions so for example if I have a volume I can describe this as L cube because it has three dimensions of length so either if it's a cube you will have length width and height even if it's a sphere you will have uh, 4 by 3 pi r cube um, so so that's defined and then you have um, I mean area is L square velocity is uh, L um, so again if I want to define the velocity that is equals to L over T and and so on so this these are your basic dimension and any physical quantity can be described in terms of those so this is one set of um, dimension you can use another set of dimensions um, which normally people use um, again some people prefer to use this force which is represented with L uh, F then you have the length which is represented with 
ta uh, L what I'm doing here I'm just um, yeah length is time okay so the time is T then the temperature is theta so and this is known as F L T theta so either you can define your physical properties in terms of basic dimensions of MLT theta or FLT but basically it gives you the same thing so now the idea with the dimensional homogeneity is that anytime you're dealing with a um, with an equation or a physical system so th the equations have to be dimensionally consistent so whatever you have on the left hand side it has to be equals to whatever you have on the right hand side and um, we will actually take a look at uh, one um, example for that so any equation has to be has to be dimensionally consistent or homogeneous consistent or homogeneous for it to work so for example this is a very well known um, equation where v is equals to v naught plus a times t so where v is the velocity uh, v naught is the initial velocity and <coughs> this equation tells you what the velocity of some substance would be if it has an initial velocity and if it has some acceleration over a period of time what will be its final velocity if it does not have any acceleration that it will only have the initial velocity so if in order for this equation to actually work the units have to be consistent and again the way we can define our velocity it basically is um, like let's suppose if I have two points this is one this is two the distance between these two points actually is delta x so if an object travels from one to two so I can say this is the distance that this object travels so the velocity is how fast it's gonna travel so I basically divide this delta x by some time and that basically gives me the velocity so the rate of change of distance is basically the velocity so higher the velocity would be the faster that person will go from or that object will go from 1 to 2 so again delta x which has the dimensions of length delta t which has the dimensions of time so l over t on this side and this has to be equals to the unit of velocity which again is l over t and then we have the dimensions of acceleration <coughs> and then that will be multiplied with the dimension of time so time comes over here but now we have to find out what our acceleration dimension would be like we have defined the velocity which is the rate of change of distance over time the acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity over time so now the idea is um, how the velocity from location 1 changes from location 2 if those two velocities are same then basically this uh, the acceleration is 0 if the velocity or at state 2 is greater than state 1 or like uh, at location 2 is greater than location 1 then you will have a positive acceleration and so on and so you can have a negative acceleration if 1 is more than 2 then you will have a negative symbol but the idea is we know what the uh, the dimensions for this is so which actually is L over T the whole thing divided by another T so this basically gives you L T square and I will substitute this for the dimensions of acceleration and you will notice that T square cancels out with this this T so L over T is equals to L over T plus L over T so this equation is dimensionally homogeneous okay so this will work because this is dimensionally homogeneous okay another thing um, about the, the dimension so we talked about the certain like dimensions mass length time and temperature to quantify 
to quantify a dimension units are used okay so we use units to basically specify okay if somebody says what's the mass then I can say okay uh, mass is 2 kg or something so the units are used to basically uh, tell you exactly how much the amount of uh, something is so there are two sets of units that are commonly used one is SI which is the system international and the other one are known as the English units I um, most of the time I, when I do examples I use SI units um, but I also use English units at times but mostly I use the um, SI units so so again what are the units so for mass it's kg in um, kilogram in um, in SI and in English units it's pound mass then you have the length which is meters and over here you have feet or foot um, then you have time which is seconds and then you have seconds over here also then in temperature you have either degree Celsius um, or Kelvin or in Fahrenheit uh, in in English units you either have degree Fahrenheit or Rankin okay so these are some units which actually specify um, how much the mass is how much the length is and how much the uh, the time in and everything else all right so this uh, and again the when the when the dimensions are homo uh, consistent then the units will also be consistent so make sure you are adding kg with a kg not kg with a gram in the same way if you are adding a pound mass uh, then don't add pound force which is the unit of force rather than um, the unit of mass so just be consistent with your units all right so next thing we're going to take a look at is are the properties of the fluid So the first property we're going to look at is the density which is represented by the Greek letter rho and it's defined as so density is defined as mass per unit volume. So if I have to write this, so density is equals to mass over volume or m over v and it will have the units of kg per meter cube. So now the idea is, if you think about it, it's the same. Um, so you have a mass over a confined volume, so mass per unit volume. So if we have a unit volume here, um, if something has more mass, it will have a higher density so let's actually take a look at some of the elements I um, I don't really have exact numbers but at least for one of those I have um, so let me like the same volumes even though it looks a little bit bigger but these are the same volumes. so V this is equals to this V and this is equals to this V so V1 is equals to V2 is equals to V3 so now for the in the same volume if I take um, iron it will have the highest density because it will occupy the greatest mass mass over here then if I take water and then I take um, air so if I want to define the density um, so let me actually write this down as rho 1 is greater than rho 2 is greater than rho 3 so this is the density of the iron this is the density of the water this is the density of the air I do know the density of the uh, water at 4 degrees Celsius is going to be 1000 kg per meter cube. Um, I think for the air is only 1 kg per meter cube. 
and of course for the iron definitely it's going to be more than this quantity here so for the same amount of volume uh, depending on and even if you're um, if you compress your air so you can add more air so you can change the density but these things even though the water can also be compressed um, but it's a little bit more difficult to do so and we will talk about one factor that tells you if things are compressible or incompressible but um, yeah but for now the solid has the highest um, density compared to the liquid and then the the gas has the lowest density all right so let's actually take a look at another um, thing which is known as the specific volume which is represented with a Greek letter nu and it's defined as volume per unit mass so specific volume is 1 over rho and it has the units of um, meter cube per kg and how we actually define this it is the specific volume is equals to V which is the volume over the mass so volume per unit mass and then we have from the uh, what we do know the volume is equals to M over rho divided by the mass and that is equals to 1 over rho so M cancels out with this M and that's why you're left with 1 over rho so if you have the density you basically have the specific volume or if you have the specific volume um, you have the density so which are basically re reciprocal to each other or inverse um, yeah so now you have the specific weight which is usually represented with a Greek letter gamma again this is defined as weight per unit volume and gamma is equals to weight over volume and then what we do know weight is equals to mass times acceleration due to gravity and then we have the V and we do know the density is equals to mass over volume so I can replace this quantity with rho and then this is G so rho G basically is equals to gamma which is specific weight and it has the units of Newton per meter cube and those units you can think about it Newton which is the unit of force divided by the meter cube which is the unit of volume so meter Newton per meter cube actually is the unit of um, specific um, weight alright so let's look at the the last quantity that we're going to talk about um, in this lecture which is the specific gravity and it's not represented by any Greek letter it's usually represented with SG and the way this defined it is defined is and again the reason um, we are defining the specific gravity doesn't really tell you anything extra uh, but but what happens is like there's so much water um, so like water is pretty much everywhere and you want to compare things with water and in fact if you think about our temperature scales are also based on the water so it goes from 0 degrees to 100 degrees Celsius which is the freezing point and the boiling point the specific gravity is also uh, something like that basically it compares the density of that substance with the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius and again why 4 degrees Celsius because that's when the density of water is maximum which is 1000 kg per meter cube so it just tells you if things are heavier than water or if things are lighter than water so anything which has a value of specific gravity more than one it will be heavier anything which has a specific gravity value less than one it will be lighter than um, uh, the water so again it is the ratio of density of substance to density of water at 4 degrees Celsius so I can write this as specific gravity is equals to density of the substance 
divided by density of water at 4 degrees Celsius. So again, 4 degrees Celsius is because that's when it's maximum and that quantity actually is equals to 1000 kg per meter cube. So we do know that. So let's look at some of the specific gravities. So specific gravities of vegetable oils they mostly range from somewhere between 0 0.9 to 0 0.95 or something. I mean even it can be um, greater than that so 0 0.9596 96 or some numbers but most of them are actually less than one so that's why oil actually floats on uh, on water and then we have the specific gravity of mercury which actually is much heavier than water so the specific gravity of mercury is 13.6 so this is a dimensionless number because the density of the substance will also have the same units the density of water will have kg per meter cube so those cancel out and you are just um, have a dimensionless number um, so again so if you have the specific gravity of mercury so that tells you the the density of mercury is is simply 13.6 times the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius which is 1000 kg per meter cube so that gives you um, 13,600 kg per meter cube and that's pretty much um, what the specific gravity tells you in the next lecture we will talk about the the viscosity and also the bulk modulus which tells you about uh, if things are compressible or not um, I hope you liked it and um, just uh, so study hard and uh, keep up the good work. Alright guys, see you in the next lecture.